Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about compressed spectral array, or CSA, and its use in paediatric intensive care. Um, so we recently got a CSA module for use in our intensive care unit, and in this talk I want to talk a little bit about how it's used, how to interpret it, how to set it up, and the monitoring that should be done while you're on CSA. But before I start with that, I want to do a little bit about EEG. So the EEG has many uses in the intensive care unit. It's used to diagnose seizures, encephalopathy, and to assess the depth of sedation. And to carry out a formal EEG is quite a labor-intensive process. It involves um, multiple scalp electrodes, um, monitoring lots of different channels. Um, typically, a recording is taken over around about 20 to 40 minutes, um, and it produces an awful lot of data that then requires interpretation retrospectively. Um, importantly, it only provides a snapshot of brainwave activity over the time that the recording is taking place. So although it's regarded as the gold standard of um, assessing brainwave activity, there are a number of limitations to its routine use in the intensive care unit. Um, like I've mentioned, it only records um, data while it's on the patient for that short amount of time. Um, it takes a while to set up um, and access to it out of hours um, may be limited. So you can't get it on quickly um, when you need it. The other problem is you can't leave it on the patient because it produces masses and masses of data um, that require interpretation. So that limits its use for continuous monitoring. Um, and also that interpretation is normally done by a specialist. Um, it's quite complex and it's not normally within the remit of the intensive care staff to interpret it. So for these reasons, there was a need for a system that could be easily set up and interpreted by the intensive care staff, allowing continuous real-time monitoring of brainwave activity. Um, and one example of this is the compressed spectral array, or CSA. So how the compressed spectral array works, and it's the clue is in the title, it compresses the raw EEG waves and produces a 3D graphical display of frequency and power against time. So on a single screen on a CSA, you can have many hours of raw EEG data all compressed into one picture. So it allows continuous monitoring importantly because, like I say, if you left the EEG on, you'd have pages and pages of data, screens and screens to scroll through. Whereas on the CSA, it's all compressed and it's easy to allow continuous monitoring. So this makes it really suitable to the intensive care environment where it can be left on the patient continuously and it doesn't produce an awful lot of data. It's also much easier to set up and interpret by the non-expert and it makes it very applicable to using in intensive care where with a little bit of basic training, um, intensive care staff are able to spot well-recognized patterns and alter treatment based on these. It does, however, require some basic knowledge on EEG waves, which I'm going to cover now. Okay, so there's four main types of EEG waves you need to know about to interpret the CSA, and they are beta waves, alpha waves, theta waves, and delta waves, and I'll cover each of these in turn. The big difference between these waves is their frequency, and that is the number of waves per second expressed in hertz. And what you'll notice in that a patient who is awake has a higher frequency of brain waves, so that's more brain waves per second compared to a patient who is asleep. So as a patient goes from being awake to asleep, the frequency or the number of brain waves per second decreases. Okay, so the first set of brain waves I want to talk about are the beta waves. So the beta waves have a frequency of 13 to 30 hertz, 
are 13 to 30 brain waves per second. And they're normally seen in a patient who is awake with their eyes open or closed. So slightly slower than the beta waves are the alpha waves and they have a frequency of 8 to 13 hertz. Um, and they're also found in an awake patient but an awake patient who is relaxed with their eyes closed. So next are the theta waves and they're slower again. Um, they have a frequency of um, 4 to 7 hertz and they're normally found during sleep. And lastly it's the delta waves. So the delta waves have a frequency of less than 4 hertz, so less than 4 waves per second and they're normally found in deep sleep. So although there are other brain waves, these are the four you need to know about to be able to interpret the CSA. And like I've mentioned, each of the, the brain waves I've talked about has their own level of consciousness. Um, so for example, if you were to have a patient who was deeply unconscious, but found a beta rhythm on the EEG, that would be abnormal because that doesn't normally fit with what a patient who has a beta rhythm should be doing and that's likely to indicate underlying brain dysfunction. So you need to match the EEG pattern to the patient's level of consciousness and ask yourself, does it fit? So there is one more thing I want to mention to you about the EEG waves. So what we've mentioned so far is the frequency, the number of brain waves per second and that decreases from beta to alpha to theta to delta. So one more thing I want to mention about the EEG waves is their power or amplitude. So that's the height of the EEG wave. And what you'll find is the higher frequency waves have a smaller height or power. And that as the waves slow down, their power increases. So their height increases. And that's an important fact to know when you start interpreting the CSA. So the next thing I want to talk about is how to interpret the CSA screen. Okay, so what you can see on the screen here is the typical output you get from the CSA. And I will break, go through each of the components in detail. So what you've got on the screen here, um, in purple, you've got the raw EEG. Um, EEG 1 at the top and EEG 2 below it. Um, when you're looking at EEG, um, odd numbers, so 1 is always looking at the left side and even numbers look at the right side. So EEG 1 is the raw, real-time, uncompressed EEG between the left-sided electrodes. And EEG 2 is the raw EEG between the right side electrodes. Um, you've got some values um, next to it, um, SEF, um, spectral edge frequency, and TP total power. Um, and they also have numbers 1 and 2, um, 1 for left-sided, 2 for right-sided. And I'll go on and explain what these numbers mean in a minute. Um, you've also got two graphical displays side by side, um, and these are the actual CSA, or Compressed Spectral Array. Um, again, CSA1 is between the left side electrodes, and CSA2 is the right sided electrodes. So I'm going to go in and start off with the CSA display um, and go through it in a bit more detail. So as we've already mentioned, um, you've actually got two CSA displays. Um, CSA1 is the left-sided um, electrodes and CSA2 is the right-sided electrodes. And what you'll notice when you look at um, one of the CSA screens is that they're made up of a number of horizontal lines. Um, there's just under 30 horizontal lines um, seen on the screen. Um, and each of these lines has peaks in certain places. So when you look at the line just at the bottom of the screen, um, this is the current CSA um, line. 
um, and it gets increasingly older as you move towards the top of the screen. So when you're looking at the CSA lines moving up, the this is the CSA looking into the past, whereas the line that's just appearing at the bottom is the current line. So this means the y-axis is time. So older time at the top, newer time at the bottom. Um, and each of the lines um, represents two seconds of activity. So like I said, you have almost one minute of CSA on the screen at a time. Uh, and the, how it works is a new line forms at the bottom and the line at the top just falls off the screen. So the y-axis is time. So um, looking at the x-axis next, um, you can see this is labelled at the bottom uh, in hertz. So this is the frequency of the brain waves at the time of the recording. Um, and we've already looked at this in the EEG waves. So this is the number of waves per second. So the higher the frequency, um, the further along the little peak in the green line will be towards the right hand side. The lower the frequency, the further the peaks in the green line will be over towards the left hand side. And you can see the numbers on the scale. Uh, and this is why I went through the EEG waves prior to describing the CSA. So you know that um, if you were to have uh, beta waves, the frequency will be over 13. And for example, delta waves will have a frequency of less than four. And the little peak that indicates the, the frequency on the CSA green line corresponds to the frequency of the EEG waves that are currently happening um, at the time the green line uh, represents. Okay, so to sum that up so far, you've got two CSA displays. CSA1 uh, is the left side of the brain, CSA2, right side of the brain. Um, the, each of the green lines represents two seconds of activity. Um, current activity um, is the bottom line on each of the CSAs, and you've got um, up to one minute of activity displayed on the CSA at one stage. And the previous lines, as you get towards the top of the screen, are getting increasingly older. Um, on each of the lines is the compression of two seconds of EEG activity and where the little peak occurs um, corresponds to the frequency of the EEG waves over that two seconds of recording. So the CSA is really useful to monitor changes in frequency um, over time. So if the frequency was to increase you would notice the peaks on each of the green lines moving further towards the right hand side or if it was to decrease, they would move further towards the left-hand side. Okay, so the next thing I want to mention is the solid yellow line you can see on each of the CSA displays. And this is the spectral edge frequency, or SEF. So the spectral edge frequency represents the highest significant frequency on each of the current CSA lines. So it's the frequency below which 90% of that segment's power lies. Um, and the yellow line is just a way of monitoring that frequency as time changes. So you can either, as frequency increases, you'll notice the peaks move over to the right hand side, but also the yellow SEF line moves over to the right hand side. It can be a bit difficult sometimes following trends and where is the peak on the line, but the yellow line makes it much easier to follow trends and frequency, and that's really how you should use it. So yellow line will move towards the right-hand side as frequency increases, and towards the left-hand side as frequency decreases. You'll also notice on the um, EEG display, there's a value for SEF1 and SEF2 in Hertz. So again, this is useful for um, being able to monitor changes in frequency with time. You've actually got a value that can be documented 
as the current um, spectral edge frequency. Okay, so the final thing I want to mention about the CSA screen is PAR. So we've already mentioned um, when we covered EEG that the PAR or amplitude of the EEG wave is its height. So how tall the EEG wave is and that we've mentioned that the higher frequency waves tend to have a lower height, so we'll have a lower PAR. And as the waves slow down and frequency decreases, they tend to have a slightly bigger wave, so we'll have a bigger PAR. Um, so the CSA display does also um, display PAR on it. And you probably notice when you look at the CSA display that the peaks on the line um, vary in their height. Um, and just like the EEG waves, the, the height of the wave um, on the, each of the green lines is a graphical representation of the PAR of the underlying EEG wave. So as the PAR of the EEG waves gets bigger, the peak on the green line will get bigger. And if the PAR of the, or amplitude of the EEG waves gets smaller, the peak on the green line on the CSA will also get smaller. So on the CSA, you've actually got a 3D graphical representation of frequency and power against time. So as frequency changes, the peaks will move towards the right or left hand side. And as power changes, the peaks will get bigger or smaller. So bigger peaks if power increases, smaller peaks if power decreases. So actually by looking at the little picture of the CSA, you can work out changes in power and frequency with time. So you've got a lot of information in that single picture. So just like um, with frequency, um, where the SEF um, gives a, a number for frequency, you get a number for power as well. And that's called the total power. And you can see it here on the screen. You've got TP1, which is the total power for the left-sided CSA, and TP2 is the value for total power for the right-sided CSA recorded at that time. So the values for total power in a patient who is awake and conscious um, is normally about two, whereas a patient who is deeply sedated, um, the total power can be less than 0.1. Okay, so you should now understand the CSA display. So I want to now go through how you can use it in paediatric intensive care. Um, and there's probably three main uses of the CSA in paediatric intensive care. I'm going to go through them one by one. Um, and the first is to assess the depth of sedation. So we've already mentioned when talking through the EEG waves, um, that each of the waves corresponds to a level of consciousness. So when you're awake, um, the EEG is predominated by alpha waves, which have a frequency of 8 to 13 hertz. When you're sleepy, um, theta waves come in, um, 4 to 7 hertz. And when deeply asleep, um, the EEG is predominated by delta waves, which have a frequency of less than 4 hertz. And sedation has a similar effect on the brain to sleep. So as in sedation is increased, the frequency of the brain waves decrease. So this makes the CSA a great tool for titrating sedation to effect and for monitoring the depth of sedation. So for most intensive care patients, we want to mimic normal sleep with our sedation and titrate the sedation to that effect. Um, so for most of our patients, that correlates to an SEF of 7 to 8 hertz. Um, and we can increase or decrease the sedation to maintain that level. Um, occasionally, in certain patients will want a deeper level of sedation. Um, for example, patients with raised intracranial pressure and traumatic brain injury or patients with um, refractory status epilepticus, where we're going to try and target burst suppression. So the CSA is really helpful in doing this. It lets you see what your patient's current level of sedation is and titrate it to where you want it to go. 
The effects of sedation on the power of the CSA is a slightly more complicated relationship, um, making it more difficult to interpret than frequency. Um, during the initial phases of sedation, the fast EEG waves, which have a low power or amplitude, are replaced by slower waves, which have a higher power or amplitude. So initially, um, during the initial phases of sedation, power will increase. And then as sedation is deepened and brainwave activity is suppressed, the power will decrease. So again, this makes power slightly more complicated than frequency to assess depth of sedation, but it is useful to look at the two of them together and monitor your trends. But importantly, during the initial phases of sedation, power will increase before decreasing as sedation is deepened. So in summary, um, when looking at depth of sedation, frequency is probably your best marker. Um, try and target normal levels of sleep and match these with your sedation, which is generally a frequency of around about seven hertz. Um, in certain situations, you may want to deepen that, um, but the CSA will help you do that. So now I want to go through a few examples of what the CSA looks like. Um, at different levels of sedation. So um, this CSA recording is from a patient who is awake with no sedation on board and no underlying brain injury. So you can, looking at the EEG itself first of all, you can see that the raw EEG has mostly alpha and beta wave activity um, with a frequency of 11 to 16 hertz. So quite fast activity with a low amplitude and therefore low power. So when we look at the actual CSA tracing, you can see that the predominance of the peaks in each of the line um, follow the trend line, the SEF line, and that they're at a frequency similar to what you've recorded for SEF. And they're slightly over towards the right hand side, these peaks and the yellow SEF line. The next example I want to show you is of moderate sedation and when you compare that to the last um, CSA display you can see that the peaks and the yellow SEF line have shifted slightly over towards the left hand side compared to the previous one so that your value for SEF1 is 5 Hz and SEF2 is 7.5 Hz. Um, you'll notice that the peaks here are slightly bigger uh, indicating an increase in power and that's because the alpha and beta waves from the previous EEG have been replaced by theta waves on this EEG. We haven't managed to get the raw EEG on this screenshot um, but take my word for it, it is theta activity. Um, so with that the theta waves have a slightly bigger amplitude than alpha and beta waves so that's why the peaks are slightly bigger. Um, like I've mentioned, the power is slightly more difficult to interpret when you're looking at depth of sedation, so you're better to stick to frequency. So in this one, the frequency has decreased. The peaks and the yellow SEF line have moved over towards the left-hand side, indicating increased depth of sedation. So this next example shows a patient who is deeply sedated. So looking at the raw EEG waves, um, first of all, you can see that the waves have quite a slow frequency um, with a SEF value of 1.5 and 1 hertz, showing that they are delta waves. When we look at the CSA display itself, again, you can see how far over to the left hand side, the peaks and the yellow SEF line have shifted, indicating that this patient is deeply sedated. If the sedation was further increased in this patient, they would probably develop what is called burst suppression. So on the um, raw EEG, uh, burst suppression is pretty easy to recognise. You get uh, bursts of high frequency activity interspaced with periods of no activity. Um, on the CSA itself, um, you get breaks in the solid yellow line. 
because you've got um, bursts of high frequency activity with interspersed with no activity, um, the values of the SEF in burst suppression will actually increase above the values you get with deep sedation without burst suppression. And this is just one of the tricks um, with CSA. Um, so if you see burst suppression on the CSA, um, the values for SEF are going to be inaccurate due to these bursts of high frequency activity. Um, and really you shouldn't be looking at the values for SEF if you've got burst suppression. How you uh, quantify um, the depth of the burst suppression, um, the more suppression um, and less bursts, the deeper um, the level of sedation is. Um, and eventually if this is increased further, there'll be just suppression and no bursts of activity. Okay, so to sum up that as sedation is increased, um, the yellow SEF line and also the peaks on the CSA trace will move over towards the left hand side, as will the values for SEF. Um, if sedation is increased even further, you get burst suppression on the raw EEG shown by breaks in the yellow SEF line. Okay, so the next um, main use of CSA in intensive care is to detect seizure activity. So seizure activity on the CSA is denoted by a sudden increase in high frequency and high power activity. So that means the yellow SEF line makes a sudden deviation towards the right hand side the peaks on the CSA tracing make a sudden deviation to the right hand side um, matching the yellow SEF line and as the power also suddenly increases you'll notice a sudden increase in the peaks on the CSA tracing. So where we mentioned previously with depth of sedation power is less useful um, in seizure activity power always increases, as does frequency. So an increase in power and frequency, which is of sudden onset, is in keeping with seizure activity. It is important to note that um, movement artifact may mimic seizure activity on the CSA, so it's important the patient isn't moving um, when you're interpreting the CSA. The other thing that can um, mimic seizure activity on the CSA is stimulating the patient, for example, handling um, a painful procedure or um, suction. Um, as you stimulate the patient, they generally wake up slightly, and that is associated with um, changing the brainwave activity from a, a lower frequency in deeper sedation to a higher frequency as less sedated. So how you differentiate that from seizure activity is firstly it's occurred in response to a stimulus rather than um, occurring spontaneously. And secondly we know that the higher frequency brain waves associated with being uh, less sedated or a patient who is being stimulated have a lower power. Whereas in seizure activity the power of the waves increases. So in both stimulation and seizure activity frequency will increase. Uh, in seizures, power also increases, but with stimulation, you would expect power to decrease. And that's how you tell the difference between the two. So I want to go on and show you now a few examples of uh, the CSA in patients who are having seizure activity. So in this first one, it's a patient with generalized seizure activity. Um, as we've said with the CSA, um, the older um, tracings are up towards the top, and the current activity is down the bottom of the CSA. So I want to look right at the top of the CSA first of all. So you can see this is a patient who is reasonably sedated. The yellow SEF line is quite far over towards the left hand side of the screen. Um, it looks to be maybe about three or four of a value for SEF. You can see that the peaks on the green CSA tracings for the first few lines um, follow the yellow SCF line as you would expect and they're again over towards the left hand side. 
You can see at the point where I've arrowed um, where the seizure starts, there is a sudden deviation of the yellow SEF line over towards the right hand side. Um, and also the peaks on the CSA move over towards the right hand side from that point, um, indicating a sudden onset of high frequency activity. Um, you can also note that the size of the peaks on the CSA have increased in size, indicating that the power of the EEG waves has also increased. So you've got sudden onset of high frequency, high power activity in keeping with seizure activity. Um, if you were, I don't have, quite have them on the screenshot here, but if you looked at the values for SCF and the values for total power, they both would have significantly increased. And on the raw EEG, there would also be evidence of seizure activity. So with the CSA, it's important you know what your baseline is. And you can see on this one, the top sort of four or five lines of the CSA are indicating the baseline. So that when there's a deviation away from the baseline, um, you know that something has happened. And if the deviation is a sudden onset, of high frequency, high power activity, it's likely to be seizure activity. Okay, so now I want to show you what um, focal seizure activity looks like. Um, as we've already mentioned, um, CSA1 and EEG1 um, look at the left side of the brain. CSA2 and EEG2 look at the right side of the brain. So I want to look first at the left side of the brain uh, first in this example. So if we look at the CSA1, you can see from the top of the tracing, which looks into the past, about a minute or so into the past, to the bottom of the tracing, which is where it's um, currently happening, um, there's no significant difference. The, the yellow SEF line is fairly flat. There's no real sharp deviation in it, and it has a value of roughly 5 to 6 um, hertz. Um, when we look at the EEG itself, it's relatively flat. Um, and the value for SEF1 is 5.5 Hz. So there's no signs really of seizure activity happening on the left hand side of the brain. Whereas the right hand side of the brain is a completely different story. You can see for the first maybe third of the CSA tracing going from the top to the bottom, um, the baseline of all the peaks are fairly far over towards the left hand side. Um, with similar values towards the um, left hand side of the brain. Um, maybe a third down the screen, there's a sudden deviation of the peaks over towards the right hand side of the screen. Uh, and the yellow SEF line also moves slightly over towards the right hand side of the screen as well. So there's definitely a symmetry between the two, which makes focal seizures quite easy to detect on the CSA. You're comparing one side with the other, rather than comparing what's currently happening with its baseline. Um, when you look at the raw EEG, um, again on the um, patient's right hand side, it's very different to the left hand side. There's seizure activity happening. And also the value for SEF2 is over double the value for SEF1. It's uh, 13.5 um, hertz compared to 5.5 hertz on the left hand side. We've managed just to cut off the values for total power, but there was a significant increase again in the total power over the right hand side of the EEG. Okay, so just like the previous example, focal seizure activity is associated with a sudden increase in both frequency and power. Um, noted both on the raw EEG and also in the CSA tracing from the side of the brain that's having the seizure activity. Okay, so the final use I want to mention for CSA and in paediatric intensive care is looking at regional blood flow. Um, and because the CSA displays activity from both sides of the brain side by side, um, it's normally fairly obvious if there's a difference between the two sides. So if you get uh, cerebral ischemia, um, how it manifests itself on the CSA 
is with reduced cerebral activity. So you get reduced frequency and reduced power. Um, and this can be due to anything that causes an interruption to blood supply. So for example, if vessels are clipped during surgery, you're gonna get a sudden reduction in frequency and power to the part of the brain that's supplied by that. If you get, um, for example, a thrombus, or if there's external compression of the brain causing ischemia um, coming from maybe uh, an external bleed or cerebral edema, they all produce a similar effect on the brain, and that is reduced activity uh, manifest on the CSA with reduced frequency and reduced power. So obviously if you get um, global cerebral ischemia from uh, generalized cerebral edema, that's gonna manifest itself by changes on both sides of the brain, which are likely to be symmetrical. So reduced frequency and reduced power, which is symmetrical. If it only involves one side of the brain, you're gonna get some asymmetry. Um, so that asymmetry can't be due to the effects of sedation. Sedation produces global effects on the brain, affecting both sides symmetrically. So if there's any asymmetry, it's either due to regional blood flow or focal seizure activity. And you need to differentiate them from each other. So I now want to look at the um, example I have on the screen of um, CSA activity. Um, so you can see a marked difference on the CSA between the left and right side. So on the left side, um, you can see the yellow SEF line um, has a value there roughly of about 21 hertz. So quite lots of high frequency activity going on on this side with lots of active brain waves. Um, over on the right side, CSA2, um, the yellow SEF line has a value of roughly 8 hertz. Um, and all the peaks are moved over towards the left-hand side. So um, this CSA could represent either one of two things. This could either be a left-sided focal seizure or right-sided cerebral ischemia. And how you differentiate um, one from the other depends on three factors, and they are the baseline, the patient's level of consciousness, and the reactivity. So looking at the baseline, first of all, um, which of these changes is new? Um, and what is the patient's baseline CSA look like? If the baseline was what you're seeing over on the right-hand side and the left-hand side is new, um, this is likely to be a left-sided focal seizure. If the baseline activity on both sides was what you have over on the left-hand side, of the CSA, um, and suddenly the, the right side was new, it's more likely to be cerebral ischemia. So um, looking at level of consciousness, um, a patient who has the left sided CSA with high frequency waves, you would expect to be awake if this was normal. Um, whereas the patient with the um, right sided CSA activity with the SCF value of eight, you would expect to be sedated. So which which fits the patient's normal um, clinical pattern? And the final thing to help you differentiate between the two is reactivity. Um, if there is signs of cerebral ischemia, um, the, that side of the brain won't react normally to stimulation, whereas the other side of the brain will. So on the side that's got cerebral um, ischemia, you'll have a much flatter um, SEF line. It won't move about as much with stimulation. So they're, they're the three factors that help you decide which is the abnormal side and help you differentiate between cerebral ischemia and focal seizures. Okay, so they were the main uses of the CSA in PICU. So who should be putting um, CSA on routinely? Um, and that's any patient who's at risk of non-convulsive status epilepticus. So it's your post-arrest patient, uh, the patient with traumatic brain injury, or any patient with um, epilepsy or risk of seizures who's going to be put on a muscle relaxant infusion. Um, it's going to mask any signs of seizure. Um, it's also useful if you're trying to um, titrate sedation to a particular level, for example, burst suppression. Without um, cerebral monitoring, you're not going to know where you are with that. 
Um, and also if your patient is having um, some abnormal signs that are abnormal movements that could represent seizure activity, it's a great way of either ruling it in or ruling it out. Um, it is important when using um, CSA um, that the patient is relatively still because movement artifacts can mimic seizure activity, make an interpretation difficult and can mean that the wrong treatment is given to a patient. Therefore, if movement artifact is making um, interpretation of the CSA difficult, um, consideration should be given to using muscle relaxant um, to facilitate accurate recording. Um, that is if the clinical question warrants its use. Okay, so that was a quick guide to what the CSA is, um, how you use it in intensive care, and how you interpret it. Now I want to go on to how you actually set up the CSA. So the first thing you need to do is gather all the equipment you're going to need. So what you need is the EEG module and its lead. You need um, five electrodes and the normal EEG electrodes are absolutely fine. And you need an alcohol skin wipe. The first thing you want to do is to plug the EEG module into the module rack and the cable into the module. Um, next you want to click on the currently selected um, monitoring screen from the top right hand corner and you need to change this to 6 wave EEG. It's important you don't select um, EEG with CSA which is one of the other options that's offered and that's because this screen doesn't leave enough room for all the other dynamic waves needed for most intensive care patients. So you can see there on the screen, six wave EEG is what you want and the one below it, EEG with CSA, um, like I say, doesn't leave enough room for all the other waves that you're gonna need. Um, next, what you want to do is touch on the icon in the bottom right hand corner off the screen and this opens the measurement selection. When you've got the measurement selection open, you want to click on the EEG module and then from the bottom um, screen will appear. Um, once you've clicked on the EEG module, set up EEG. So that brings the setup EEG menu and in this you want to select show montage. This will then bring the montage up on the screen and this is very useful to help confirm um, that you've put the electrodes into the correct place when you're setting up the CSA. Um, you can see that by default um, montage A is selected. If for any reason you do want to change the montage you can do that from the pull down menu. Um, for example you can't apply the electrodes in the specified positions you might want to use a different montage. But for most patients just leave it on montage A. The next thing you need to do is to um, clean the skin with the alcohol wipe over the forehead and both temporal regions and let it dry. The next step is to apply your reference electrode to the middle of the patient's forehead and then plug this in to the middle slot on the EEG cable. Next, you want to attach the FP1 electrode to the left hand side of the patient's forehead. Um, this then plugs into the EEG1 plus slot, which is the far left hand um, side of the EEG cable. Next is the FP2 electrode to the patient's right hand side of their forehead. And this plugs into the far right hand uh, space on the EEG cable, um, which is EEG2 plus slot. Next thing you want to attach the T3 electrode um, to the patient's left temporal region. Um, this plugs into um, the second from the left space on the EEG cable and it's marked as EEG1 negative. Next is the T4 electrode to the patient's right temporal region and this plugs into the space second from the right on the EEG cable um, marked EEG2 negative. 
you'll see that as you start attaching the electrodes um, and plugging them into the cable um, on the montage the circle will change from initially a red x to a white question mark and this is useful as you're plugging them into the cable to check that you've um, the, the electrodes that you're plugging in is in the right location as you add um, more electrodes to the cable um, what you'll notice is that either the um, symbol will change to an amber arrow which indicates that the impedance is above the set limit or a green tick indicating that the impedance is below the set limit. Um, you can see on the screen um, I've, it's circled in red the, the, the top thing circled is your currently set impedance limit um, and this defaults to 5 and you can see in the circle below um, the current values for the impedance in each of the electrodes that you have on. So you can see there in the screenshot the impedance limit is 5 and the values for each of the electrodes are 8, 17, 12 and 7. So they're all above the set limit which is why they're all showing up as amber arrows. So ideally we would like the values for impedance in each of the electrodes to be less than 10. Um, if this isn't the case, um, you might want to check it's properly adhered to the skin, consider cleaning the skin again and reapplying a new electrode or using some tape to secure the electrodes to the skin. Um, while ideally we would like it to be less than 10, the CSA will still work with values up to 40. And some studies have shown that it's still accurate with values up to 40. Um, but what you need to do is to then adjust your impedance limit. Um, and you do this with the keys um, I've highlighted at the bottom of the screen. Impedance limit up or impedance limit down. And in general you should um, increase the impedance limit so that it's 5 above the highest impedance value. So you can see in the next screen the impedance limit has been adjusted and all the electrodes now have a green tick. You can then um, close the CSA montage by pressing the X in the top right hand corner. Um, at this stage you will have the raw EEG displayed on the screen. So EEG1 and EEG2. You'll also have values for SCF1 SEF2, total power 1 and total power 2 but you won't have the CSA display on the screen. Um, to get the CSA screen to display you need to click the button on the bottom of the screen which says EEG CSA and you can see it highlighted there on the screenshot. When you do um, the CSA screen will appear and this can be dragged into whatever position you want on the screen. If you touch the touch screen for any other reason, um, the CSA display will disappear off the screen again. Your raw EEG and your values for total power and SEF will stay, but the CSA display will disappear. So you need to touch the same button at the bottom of the screen again to bring it up again. Um, if you want to adjust any more settings um, to get into the CSA menu, Again, press the menu selection button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Repeat the steps by clicking on the EEG module and then the setup EEG button that will appear at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can then see all the options that appear in the setup EEG module. Um, this allows you to customize your display by turning on some other lines and values. Um, although by default we just have the SEF line on the screen. Um, so for most patients there's no need to go into this menu and make any further adjustments. But this is how you get to the menu just in case you want to make any changes. If you want to um, print a screenshot um, there is a button that says print report down the bottom left hand corner of the screen. So if you press this, um, it'll make a printout of the last hour's um, CSA recording and a message uh, printing on database 
will appear on the screen. Um, the report will print in the equipment store. And this is an example of the report you'll get. So it gives you um, what the current AEG um, looks like. It gives you your current values for total power and SEF with also um, an hour's worth of the CSA display from both sides of the brain um, together at the bottom with the current impedance values. So if at any stage um, one of the electrodes was to become loose, its impedance value will exceed the set limit and the trace on that side of the CSA will disappear and the values for SEF1 and total power on that side will be replaced by a question mark. Um, so if this happens, this indicates that there's a problem with one of your electrodes. So what you need to do is bring the montage up like you did at the start when setting up the CSA. Um, it will then highlight the problem electrode and help you fix the problem. So now I want to go on and talk about um, observation and documentation while on CSA. So while a patient's on, compressed spectral array, a daily CSA events log form, um, which you can see here, should be completed by the bedside nurse. And any event that could affect the CSA tracing um, must be documented on the form. So the advantage of this is it allows the CSA to be interpreted retrospectively. Um, and any changes um, to the CSA in response to an intervention can be determined and any changes due to the artifact can be disregarded. Um, so you can see the events log form here. There's a few details to record about the patient's level of sedation, whether they're paralysed and the indications for using the CSA. Um, the um, skin electrode site should be checked um, once per shift. There's somewhere to document that that has been done. Um, also, if the electrodes are changed, um, there's somewhere for that to be documented during the shift, and also it's somewhere to note when the last time the electrodes had been changed. They should ideally be changed every 48 hours. Uh, and then there's space on the form to um, log any intervention. So what should be recorded on the CSA events log? Well, first and foremost, if there's any um, clinical seizure activity, um, it should be recorded together with the description of the event. Um, if there's any clinical findings that may or may not be related to um, possible seizure activity, for example, dilated pupils, tachycardia, hypertension, um, sudden spikes in ICP, um, or if there's any intervention such as a sedation bolus, um, an increased rate, addition of a new sedating infusion, or the administration of any anti-epileptic drugs, that should also be documented. Um, likewise, if there's any source of artifact, um, it's important that that's recorded. Um, for example, if the electrodes are adjusted, there's any patient movement or handling, for example, for physiotherapy, patient curves or suctioning. It's important that the start of the event is recorded and the end time recorded um, together with the description of the event. Um, and you can see an example of a filled in um, record here. This is really, really important. Um, without accurate recording um, of what's actually happening to the patient when they're on CSA, if you look at the um, tracing afterwards, you have no idea whether a change in frequency on the CSA was related to an actual seizure or whether it was just patient handling or patient suctioning. So filling this in accurately is really, really important and not doing it accurately could mean that an unnecessary drug which could have harmful side effects is administered to the patient. So to go with the um, events log which um, should be filled in um, it's important that an actual CSA tracing is obtained um, by the bedside nurse every hour on the hour um, by clicking on the print report button in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. So if this is successful, a message printing to database will appear um, and the report will print to um, the printer in the equipment store. So this will generate a report of um, CSA activity for the last hour 
um, together with a brief recording of what the current EEG is on both sides and the current values for SEF and total power and the impedances at the bottom. Um, so in receipt of this report, um, the impedance levels should be checked to make sure they're below the set limit. Um, if not, obviously bring the montage up and try and rectify the problem. Um, it's really important this is done every hour because the, the CSA printed report only captures the last hour's data. So if there is any delay in printing it out, there will be missed activity um, that can't be documented. So ideally print every hour on the hour and that way there will be a continuous record of CSA activity which can be analysed with the events log to work out whether any spikes in the activity are due to actual seizure activity or whether they're due to artefact. What then should be done, the printout um, should be annotated using the numbers from the um, CSA events log um, that are relevant to that hour's tracing. Um, and you can see an example of a CSA events log um, which has been recorded here on the screen um, and the printout of the CSA report and you can see the events here have been annotated at the correct times on the CSA printout. And this just means somebody coming along can see what each of these um, annotations mean on the CSA and can then interpret that and make an accurate determination about what was going on with the patient during that episode. Um, so that was a quick run through um, CSA. Um, there is some more uh, information on my website, um, paediatricemergencies.com. You need to go to the clinical tab and then click on the compressed spectral array um, icon. This will then take you to the compressed spectral array homepage where there's a written guide to using CSA in paediatric intensive care. I hope you find this useful. Thanks for listening.